Should we nuke a hurricane? I know this question has been in the news and many of you have asked me this since uh, in our previous episode of Because Science, we were thinking about nuking Mars, but since some people have suggested maybe throwing a nuclear bomb into a hurricane to dissipate it, possibly the uh, Hurricane Dorian, what should we do about a hurricane? Is a nuclear bomb a viable idea. Well, we can evaluate this scientifically, as is our want to do on this show and this channel. The first consideration I would bring up is, hmm, maybe a nuclear bomb could change the pressure in a way that is significant as to dissipate the hurricane. Well, if you do the math for this, let's assume that the eye of the hurricane is pretty large, a, a, a mature hurricane. It's maybe 20 kilometers in diameter. Then to decrease, uh, or to change rather, the pressure enough in the eye of a hurricane to kind of <sighs> the hurricane away, you find that a nuclear bomb would have to move about half a billion tons worth of air into the hurricane itself. Now, when a nuclear bomb goes off, it definitely moves air around, but nothing on that scope and scale. So changing the pressure with a nuclear bomb doesn't really work. That's our first X in nuking a hurricane. Our second thing that we could bring up is I would say power. Hurricanes are incredibly powerful. Maybe if a nuclear weapon could get on the same level of power production, it could start to release energy such that it would again, dissipate the hurricane. Well, how much energy, uh, how much power rather, uh, which is energy per second, energy per time, how much does a hurricane put out? Well, a very uh, mature hurricane, again, a large hurricane, can put out a ton of energy. We're talking like 200 trillion watts? Yes, that's the value. Like 200 trillion watts, which is a lot. And we'll get to that scale in just a second. The largest bomb in the, uh, the largest nuclear weapon in the United States arsenal currently releases a lot of energy too. We can look up that value and we find about five times 10 to the 15 joules. So this is about a megaton, a little over a megaton's worth of energy, if you compare it to the energy contained in a ton of TNT. Anyway, so now we have two values, the power for the hurricane and the energy contained in a single, our largest nuclear weapon. And I think when we uh, suggest this hurricane nuking idea, most people think of just a single nuke. Could a single nuke at the eye of the hurricane dissipate it? Well, Let's divide these values. If we divide the energy of a single nuclear bomb by the power of a hurricane, we can get the amount of bombs that we would need over time to get to the same power value, or, or how many bombs we would need to get to the same power value based on this energy. So you do that math, and you find that uh, to get on the level of a hurricane's power, we would have to drop the most powerful nuclear bomb in our arsenal into the eye of the hurricane, uh, two and a half just about times every minute. Every minute we would have to drop more than one of our biggest nuclear bombs into the eye of a hurricane. As you can probably figure out, this is nowhere near viable. The, 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 the levels of destruction we would start to cause over, you know, just a few hours with dozens of bombs dropping, our largest would be terrifically terrible. So that's another X here. What's the last thing that we can consider? Well, obviously, if a nuclear bomb went off in a storm, there would be a lot of fallout. Nuclear bombs produce nuclear fallout. Uh, particles that are radioactive that can then uh, rain down basically on the ground below in the form of dust and just particles. If you blew up a nuclear bomb inside of a hurricane, you would basically come up with a supervillain-like dispersal system for fallout. It would effectively uh, increase the range of the fallout exponentially and just move it across a large swath of the United States if that's the country that we are considering. So, nuking a hurricane. A nuke isn't anywhere near powerful enough or we need too many of them. A single nuke or just a few nukes, as I think we think about this, is not enough to change the pressure such that the hurricane will dissipate and it would create dangerous and deadly fallout across a wide swath of the United States. If you put all of this together, no, we should not nuke a hurricane. I think many of you saw that answer coming, but we have the numbers to make it 
a true true, as they like to say. Hello, <laughs> who likes to say that? Hello and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live, the live show on the Because Science YouTube channel where I like to take all of your comments, questions and corrections and weird comments about my hair and face and try to evaluate them to the best of my ability. Look, I'm not a working scientist. I, I am a terrible artist, but I know a little bit about a lot of sciencey and pop culture things. So if you have a question for me, you can put it in the YouTube chat and we'll try our best to get to it. Make sure it's interesting and nerdy, and hopefully we'll pick it. If you are spamming the chat, I will never select you. I have Voice of the Void Nate here reading me questions. Hey. Well, you sound a little bit different. Yeah, I've got a cold. That's a bad cold. Well, anyway, Nate's here to read your questions, so Nate, what do you got? Uh, Sam Averageman says... Wow, you says, sound so much different. Howdy, Kyle. Hurricane Dorian is going to hit us tomorrow. My oh. question is, why do... My, why, my question is, why do hurricanes in the Atlantic usually swing west towards North America rather than east up towards Europe? Yeah, so the movement of hurricanes, uh, specifically Dorian, is interesting, and uh, I don't know the mechanics of all of it because I'm not a meteor meteorologist, um, but a big determining factor... Uh, one of the determining factors in how hurricanes move and how they spin and why they spin in the first place, uh, one direction in the northern hemisphere and the opposite direction in the southern hemisphere of our planet is something uh, called the Coriolis effect. So if you pick a reference frame such that it is rotating and we're, we're observing it, if we, if we consider ourselves as like not moving basically, we can explain how things move in as, as they are rotating with uh, substituting in a fictional, a fictitious force. And in this, uh, in this case, we call it the uh, Coriolis force. If you are in something like, uh, say, one of those carnival machines that spins you around, we can do the same kind of thing. Or if we consider ourselves stationary and we watch how things move in this rotating frame, we get these centrifugal forces, which aren't real forces, but in a certain frame, they're real enough so we can do math. So we have the Coriolis effect uh, uh, acting on hurricanes as they form and as they move because the Earth is spinning and at the equator it acts to move things out away from the equator in clockwise and anti-clockwise ways. This is why a hurricane will deflect one direction versus the other in depending on which uh, hemisphere it is in and, and that also determines its spin. So which hemisphere it's in will determine where it's going to basically curve. And there's also, uh, you know, um, pathways through, through which, uh, you know, there's a, uh, what, what is it? What is it called? It's not the jet wind, jet stream. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. I mean, there's different weather patterns that also determine these kinds of things, but uh, this, the rotation of the planet Earth itself is what helps make these curve, deflect, and twist the way that they do, I think. Um, the jet air. That's not a thing. Milan Van Kulen says, Hey Kyle, in your opinion, which famous sci-fi technology are we closest to actually achieving with our current level of scientific knowledge? That's a good question. I was, um, I was thinking about this the other day. Why hasn't our, our want of a science fiction device advanced since jetpacks and flying cars? Like, I'm, I'm sure the first time we thought this up and it became uh, present in popular consciousness, I'm sure it was like 50, 60 years ago or more. Why hasn't the same thing happened with more recent ideas in sci-fi? Like, what happened to all our AIs that would help us become super intelligent? You never hear anyone except for me say that kind of thing. So it's, it's odd to me that there isn't another like low hanging fruit kind of technology that's uh, taken root in what we consider science fiction and the world of tomorrow. That's kind of weird. But what are we closest to? Um, I'd say we're, we're probably closest to fully autonomous driving cars everywhere. I mean, it wouldn't take all, I mean, it's gonna take a lot of economics and a lot of people trading in their cars and stuff like that, but it wouldn't be that hard to get every car in the world to start driving itself. And I, and I believe in many countries, there, it's now the standard. There are regulations that cars need some level of self-driving capabilities, whether that's lane assist or being able to tell when you're not looking at the road, something like that. So uh, most cars going forward are gonna have something to uh, resemble self-driving capabilities, but full self-driving, I think, is going to be the closest thing and really more sci-fi than you might think it is because when every single car can drive itself based on you know computer systems and, and whatnot and cameras and looking at stuff and doing math, when that happens, traffic is gonna go down, 
deaths on the road is going to go down, pollution is going to go down, productivity for the average worker is going to go up as you're not losing time to your commute. It's going to change society in a pretty big way in my estimation of things. Um, so I think that's the closest to going to happen soon and going to have a large effect. It, for more like sci-fi-y kind of things, I don't know, Navy's testing out big lasers that can burn your face off from like a mile away. They're not just close to that, they're doing that. You can look it up on YouTube. They do it to drones. They explode drones at sea. Anywho, Nate, before I get, uh, you know, like put in a black site, could you? No, I was, uh, I was enjoying that. Okay. Um, Fat Baby Jake asks, hey, Kyle, He's hope your weekend is starting off well. Is there any way we could possibly figure out a way to use hurricanes to store and use their energy for general use? Figured it was worth asking. Yeah, well, thank you for hoping my weekend goes well. I, I'm... You know, as you know, I'm trapped here, so I don't really do anything else, but I, I appreciate it. Um, like we were just saying, a tremendous amount of power is harnessed up in a hurricane. So could, is there some way, uh, you know, the, the first thing that comes to mind is some kind of wind farm apparatus, but you would need, they would be, have to be uh, tremendously robust to handle the wind speeds and the wind shear and stuff like that. That would be uh, through a hurricane and, and hurricanes when all is said and done, are rather infrequent. So you'd have to come up with the economic and engineering solution that has the good rate of return, ROI, on your investment, as they like to say. So uh, hurricanes have a lot of power, but they're relatively infrequent. They cause a lot of damage, and the infrastructure you'd have to create to perfectly harness or uh, harness in a, in a way that you're not actually losing money, um, that would probably be a very tall order. Um, so I, I would say it's pr it's... If you do a cost benefit analysis, there's probably, it's probably more effort than it's worth. If I had to guess, um, you probably could get energy out of a hurricane, but uh, I think it'd be harder done than said. Yes, that makes sense. Okay. Andre Botella asks, hey Kyle, as a supervillain, I'm sure you've considered hey, this. Hey now. What is uh, this? There's no proof that I'm a supervillain. None. Not one proof of it. What is the smallest size for a black hole to render the Earth uninhabitable when created inside the atmosphere? I'm asking for a friend. Yeah, which is me. I mean, no one. Um, the smallest size black hole that would render Earth uninhabitable if it was in the atmosphere. I, <laughs> dude, I have no idea. Um, the, the thing that I, th so I, I don't know. Like, like we were saying in a previous episode, you could put a microscopic black hole at the center of Jupiter and it would transform it pretty substantially over a long enough time frame. So you don't need a giant black hole. But the thing to understand about black holes, again, is that when, when you're outside of the event horizon, outside of their extreme gravitational influence, especially if it's, a, if it's a very small black hole, it's not like everything on Earth would instantly be sucked towards it. So matter needs time to receive the information that it's moving, for example. So if you if you had a giant swimming pool and you basically create a black hole at the bottom of it, you know, just pulling the, let's, let's say a giant Olympic sized swimming pool had a giant drain on one end and you were at the other end. If you open that drain, you wouldn't know that the pool was draining for a while and you wouldn't be moved towards it for a while. You wouldn't instantly feel it. So just putting something as crazy scary as a black hole in the atmosphere wouldn't immediately cause destruction, but it would start siphoning in material, getting more and more energetic and large and stuff. So uh, I don't know what the actual answer is. I'd, I'd guess that really any size black hole that isn't going to immediately evaporate, which are, those are super, super tiny, like nanoscale, um, if it was like a black hole the size of your hand, I bet that'd be bad. I don't know if it would immediately destroy the Earth, but how would you even, how would you even, would that just be the end of the Earth? I mean, could you push the black hole away? I don't know. That might be a doomsday kind of device. I don't know, man. I'm not a supervillain. I said that. I have no idea. Matterbeam asks, I have a question. MB, the OG SN. I, I, question. Kyle is bringing okay. awesome scientific concepts to life. A lot of them are scary and destructive, but decades old. What more recent discovery gives you goosebumps? Oh, good question. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's hard. So in the, in the last couple of uh, episodes on uh, the channel, we've been going through kind of the history of very scary sounding things and projects. In fact, Guess what? There's another one coming our way <laughs> pretty soon. Um, but uh, more recent discoveries that scare me, I don't know. Maybe I'm just naive, but uh, 
you know, for the things that can, for the, for the more modern sciences that could get really scary, let's say artificial intelligence or genetic engineering, there's a lot of regulations in place when this science is done uh, to prevent it from being more super villainy, if you will. I mean, like something like the Manhattan Project was slightly different where we, ha we tried to bring all the best minds together to help win a war and we created something terribly destructive. Um, but if you're talking about you know, discovering that we can clone people or change or make designer babies or what have you. That doesn't scare me as much because I know it would take a societal change and an ethical change across a, a whole country or the entire planet to have these things become more scary and science fictional. And that goes with nanoscale engineering and artificial intelligence. So nothing off the top of my head really gives me goosebumps. It is the stuff, uh, to contrast that, it is the stuff back in history where we weren't thinking about the consequences or uh, the, the regulations were more lax and something terrible could have happened. Um, those are the things that, that, that scare me. I mean, like, uh, I, I kind of want to do a video on this because I, I love uh, nuclear physics and such, but you know, there's this story where they were doing criticality testing at Los Alamos and uh, to lower a sphere on top of a core of plutonium to test when that core would go critical, one dude was just lowering it down and keeping the sphere, which reflected neutrons, to make it go critical. One guy was just holding the sphere open with just a screwdriver. And then the screwdriver slipped and he died a couple days later. And there was reported a blue flash of light and a wave of heat in the room. That's the scary stuff, my man. Got to have regulations on your, on your science, probably. I'm not all Rick about this. Kajan yeah. asks, how fast would you have to throw a human at the earth to cause a global wipeout? What? What am I doing? Is, am I being su so super villainy that you people are saying things? Like, how fast would I have to throw a person at earth to destroy it? I don't know. The I'll, I'll take a cop-out answer because I don't like where all this is going. It would have to be near light speed. It just would. Um, a human is not a very robust thing. We're squishy, we're fragile. We are just a few electrons misplaced away from being not alive anymore. Wow. <laughs> I stumbled into that and that's, de that's depressing. Anywho, all of life is just the flow of electrons and it's easily disturbed. Oh, man. Okay, wait. Let me try that again. You can die at any... Let me try that again. Uh, humans aren't as robust as like metal. So if you th there we go. So if you threw a human through the atmosphere at extreme speed, it'd probably burn up like a bullet, not being able to make it through water, kind of. Um, the drag forces would rip a human body apart. So you would need to be going so fast that you'd pass through air and material like it wasn't even there and it wasn't even being considered because you're going so fast. So near light speed, you'd have to get, and we know. From, yeah, from Einstein and other great thinkers that nothing with mass can move at the speed of light. So it would take a tremendous amount of energy to get a human moving at light speed. So you'd have to think of your own super villainy, super villainy way to create a large human collider, the LHC, and then you can move a human that fast. Vantor Vantor asks, I know the moon has an effect on the tides and tectonic plates. I was mm. wondering what would happen to these if the moon was to let's say, be dragged off by a space kraken. <laughs> what is going on? Should I change how this channel operates because I'm not a supervillain? If the moon was dragged off by a space kraken, what would happen? Well, we get this kind of question a lot, uh, dur especially during the live segments, and I, again, I don't know all the specifics. You could probably find an article like this, but if you remove the moon, it would change a, a substantial number of effects. Not only, uh, not only the tides, uh, the gravi uh, gravitation, the uh, continental drift. You said tectonic motion. Sure, let's lump those two together. But it would also have effect on you know the the wildlife, say, uh, with no more uh, light from the moon, reflected light from the sun onto the moon at night. You wouldn't have the same kind of day-night cycle as as um, organisms are used to on this planet. And so uh, you'd have some kind of ecological shift. I do not know what would happen further than that. Uh, I'm not an expert, but you can look up those questions and uh, I bet it's bad. I bet it's not good. Life evolved on Earth with the moon there. 
we, even if it's a small effect, the effect is there. So if you remove it, of course, there's going to be some kind of knock-on effect onto the ecosystem. Again, the Earth is going to be, would be fine without it. Fine, because it's robust. It's, it's just a rock with some biofilm on it. Oh, I'm pressing myself again. You know what? I'm, I'm punting. I'm punting on this one. Bolton Just Man asks, do you think full nerve reattachment will ever be technological slash medically viable, or are they simply too small? Wow, uh, I, this is way out of uh, my field of expertise, so I won't comment on it. I will say, though, I do know a little bit about this. So, you know, I know some people who have recently gone through surgery, and a big part of surgery or injury um, is that if you have nerve damage, you can lose feeling in whatever that limb or whatever body part or tissue. You can lose feeling, and, uh, and, uh, well, your nerves can become destroyed and you can lose feeling for the rest of your life, and that is really bad. That is because, that is because I believe this is what it's called. Nerves undergo uh, what's, what's called a Wullerian, Wullerian degeneration, I think is the word. Um, and so when a nerve dies or gets damaged, it dies like all the way back to the start of the nerve. And so it's, it's hard to reattach nerves, it's hard to get them to grow back, and so you could have a loss of feeling or numbness or what have you in some tissue or limb or body part for the rest of your life, and that's a big problem. I do not know any of the current research on uh, nerve reattachment or reassignment or what have you, so I cannot comment on it, but it's it would be a boon to surgery if we could figure out how to better um, how to better ensure that after surgery there's not there, there's not these lifelong effects from say if you can't feel you know your index finger or something like that after hand surgery. Attila area views. I hope I'm saying that slightly correctly. Doesn't says, sound like you are. What is the thing you are most glad you learned? What is the thing I'm most glad I learned? Um, it's okay not to know something. Most of the time, especially, I, I don't know if you were like me, but if you're still in school or if, or if you were in school, um, a lot of the time you can kind of be disincentivized from asking questions by feeling too embarrassed to be wrong about something. And once you let go of that, you find that you're liberated and you can ask all the questions you want to ask and you find often in my experience that if you are curious about something or have a question about something, a lot of other people had the exact same question. It's just that everybody is too afraid to ask what the answer to something is. So I would say it's uh, letting go of always needing to be right and knowing the importance of being wrong is very important uh, uh, to learn. At least it was to me. And that's why I try to answer questions off the top of my head during a live stream. Esteris asks, hi, could we use a vacuum like in space to preserve food for a longer time like a vacuum fridge? Hmm. Hmm. Vacuum fridge. So I think what if you were to, hmm. Vacuum fridge. Okay, so the, some of the advantages of space uh, would be that it's very, 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 very cold. The average temperature of space is, a is, I believe, three Kelvin, which is just three Kelvin above absolute zero, of course. So it's very cold. So over time, a material, if it was hot, like say a chicken that you slapped until it, it, it became cooked, um, it would eventually go back down to that temperature and it would freeze. The other advantage is that there's no air in space. So you don't have oxygen, you don't have things that could feed microorganisms to grow on the surface of a food item. And so you probably wouldn't get mold or the same kind of degeneration um, that you would get here on Earth or something like that. However, uh, if you had something like a food item, it's gonna be blasted by radiation from the sun, which might damage it on the outside. And uh, the, the forms of heat loss in space, it's just uh, radiation. There's no air again, so nothing's touching it and nothing, no fluid is moving past it to remove heat energy. So uh, you lose heat over time through radiation, but very slowly because radiation is the least quick and least efficient form of heat loss. So if you had a fully cooked chicken, out there and you threw the chicken breast into space, uh, it would still take quite a long time to freeze, I 
think it would hours and hours to freeze and because of that um, when you don't freeze something very quickly like flash freezing uh, large ice crystals can form inside of the cells and this is what pops those cells and damages them and then creates a uh, freezer burn and that's what freezer burn is so flash freezing gets around that and in space I don't think you flash freeze anything you may see some kind of frost on uh, on uh, on a material form immediately but this is because the uh, moisture on the outside is evaporating away like it would on your tongue if you pat and then you pass out and then you die but if you had a food item I, I suspect that it might freeze so slowly that it would actually just cause really bad freezer burn and it would get sunburn and even though it's dead it I don't know I don't think you could just throw something into space and have it be preserved is my answer to that question eternal salt asks hey, hey Kyle. One, one or two more I think we have here hey Kyle should we manipulate the weather as a means to reduce climate change Wow well uh, so, I mean, there are ideas like cloud seeding to get more rain uh, onto a piece of land or not, say, if it's if it's in drought, but this is all part of a water cycle, of course. So something like cloud seeding, if you're, if you're taking water from some, if you're adding water to some place, you're taking it from somewhere else. You're remo you're, you're kind of, uh, you have an economy of water you can work with in the water cycle and you're moving it someplace else. So, uh, so another place is going to lose that water that you're moving. So I'm guessing what you're getting at more is more terraforming kind of thing. And as far as I know, most of the ideas to terraform Earth and uh, help reverse climate change are of a scope and scale that it doesn't really make sense right now. There's, there's other things that we can do, uh, say, basically going carbon neutral as best we can with everything, with, with cars and power plants, you know, nuclear power, all these kind of things would be easier than, say, you know, trying to change the surface content of all of Antarctica to reflect more sunlight back out into space or something because as the ice melts, it, it, the ice doesn't have the uh, ice being white or reflects uh, radiation from the sun much better than the more grayish, greenish ground. So you get this, you get this uh, effect that kind of spirals out of control. More ice melts and so it, uh, so it absorbs more sun and then that gets hotter which melts more ice, etc, etc, etc. So um, every terraforming Earth idea that I've heard doesn't sound like something that's very feasible. So I would, I would definitely defer to ideas that we can act on right now, like going carbon neutral in those areas that I mentioned. But it's, 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 uh, it is a, it's the biggest crisis. And we need, to do, we need to do something. It's not going to just fix itself, I assure you. Kara Harper One asked, more, I think. we have. Yes. Kara Harper asks, should we put more effort and resources into building a moon base or a Martian base? Martian base is going to be harder. I would, I would guess that if you wanted to establish a stepping stone to other planets, the rest of the solar system, what have you, starting at the moon would probably be best because... It's going to be hard either way to establish a habitat on uh, Mars or the Moon. You're going to have to have, uh, you know, habitable living spaces, domes filled with air. You're going to need water. You're going to need your own food. It's not going to just grow on whatever surface you bring uh, or whatever surface is there, rather. So you're going to have to establish a habitat for us with air, food, and water regardless. And the Moon is just closer. And we've already been there. So I would suggest... Uh, moon base is probably the most feasible thing first. And I mean, how cool would that be if humanity, if there is human, if there are humans living on the moon, it'd be a new era of humanity. Think do we have time for a quick one. We have time for a quick one. Ooh, um, a little quick one. Iron Man, F E Man, asks, "Hey Kyle, <laughs> Dude, what is nice. your favorite element and why?" I like. I wow! I have a very specific answer for this. I like mercury. And I like mercury because it's one of the few elements, I think it's out of three, there's only three? There might be two. Anyway, it's one of the few elements that is liquid at room temperature. I think bo uh, bromine is one of the other ones. Um, anyway, mercury is liquid at room temperature. It's metal. It's a metal. So it's liquid metal at room temperature, which is just weird and cool just by itself, but it's also incredibly dense. I think it's 14.3 times denser than water, and I have a very specific memory of why this is my favorite element. It is because in eighth grade, in Mr. Daginsky's class, um, eighth grade science class, he, he had a vial of mercury. Don't worry, it was sealed, and you know there was no vapor getting out. It was safe. But he had a vial of mercury, and he passed it around. And when it finally got to me, I swear I had nothing, I had no conception of what it'd be like, and when I grabbed it, it felt like it felt like five pounds in my hand, and I was so 
astounded by the difference between what I expected to happen and what actually happened. And I think that gets to my fascination with science in general. But the moment I had that vial of mercury in my hand and Mr. D showed me, it's like, wow, isn't that this, this weird element amazing that it can be so different from what you expect? That was the moment that I, I liked mercury forever. I miss, I miss Mr. D. Um, so that's all the time we have for this episode of Because Science Live. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for all the questions. Go back and watch the last episode of Because Science if you haven't yet. It's all about should we nuke Mars? Hey, we were nuking a hurricane before. In both cases, spoiler alert, the answer is probably shouldn't do it. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. If you want to engage with me or Because Science or suggest ideas for future episodes or ideas uh, for Because Science Live, you can follow us at Because Science everywhere and Because Science on Facebook and, of course, YouTube. Again, have a wonderful rest of your weekend. If you are anywhere near a storm like Dorian, good luck, be safe, be smart. If you're not, there are obviously... uh, uh, phone numbers, agencies, websites you can go to to help donate or to volunteer or, uh, or, or anything like that. So uh, stay safe, stay nerdy, have a great weekend, and be nice to each other because this is all we got. <laughs>